Hey, it's Dr. Cody Raw with Tech for Psych. In my previous video, we talked about how these devices, the personal EEG headsets, actually work. In this video, I wanted to talk about what they're actually measuring. Now, the shorthand answer is that they're measuring brain waves, but there's a lot more to it than that. Every little peak in a brainwave signal represents thousands of neurons firing in synchrony. Now there's a lot of different frequencies that are going on in the brain and they represent different mental functions. And in breaking them down, we can create what some people call an alphabet of the brain. All right, so in my previous video, we talked about how these devices actually work, these personal EEG devices. They kind of function as circuits. You've got this voltage change that's happening between electrodes, and the computer is picking that up, that alternating current, and converting that into digital code. So what's actually creating that alternating current, that voltage difference between the electrodes on the device? Well, in my previous video, I talked about how there are billions of neurons and they are arranged in certain ways in the brain. One that we're interested in are these columns that are right near your cortex, these pyramidal cells. And the way that these cortical columns work is they fire these electrical signals that go elsewhere in the brain, but in doing so, they build up these uh, charge gradients. And in, in one area of your head, you can build something up called a local field potential. And this local field potential is always fluctuating. And that is what we know of as the most likely cause of the electrical signals that are coming from the brain. Now, as we talked before, the actual EEG signal is a difference between voltage between two electrodes. Now, the way that the signal fluctuates will affect what the EEG signal actually is. So for instance, thinking back to your college physics days, you have in-phase fluctuations and out-of-phase fluctuations. So let's imagine a neuron is firing and that firing is represented by a sine wave. So you're gonna have this sine wave going up and down with peaks and troughs. If you have two neurons that are firing at the same time, their peaks and troughs will be in synchrony. And if that happens, when the EEG signal is analyzed, it's going to add those signals together, creating a higher amplitude in each peak and trough than you would have had with it alone. Now the opposite of that would be if neurons were out of phase. For instance, if each peak on the first active electrode corresponded with each trough in the other electrode and they kept going out of phase like that. Now if that happens, if you add those two waves, waveforms together, you're gonna get a cancellation of them. So the difference is that when neurons fire together, they create higher amplitude peaks and troughs in the EEG signal. When neurons don't fire together and are random and canceling each other out, the amplitude will be a lot smaller in an EEG signal. A good example of high amplitude EEG signals is seizures. So when someone has a tonic-clonic seizure, uh, you know, they typically go unconscious and shake violently, right? Well, a lot of the neurons, especially in the motor cortex, are firing in synchrony. They're having large discharges at the same time, which is creating the uh, shaking movement. And if you look at an EEG of someone that's having a seizure, you'll see high amplitude regular waveforms because all the neurons are firing in synchrony. So let's take a step back and talk about theory for a second. Why do you need all these different oscillation frequencies of neurons firing in the brain? What does it mean? Well, it all comes down to communication. Different oscillation frequencies in different parts of the brain mean different things. Each task has its own alphabet of oscillating frequencies, whether you're doing arithmetic, whether you're walking, anything that we do has a symphony of brain oscillations that's going on that represents that task. Typically for simpler tasks, you have fast oscillations and for more complicated tasks, you have slow oscillations. Another way to think about that is there's uncountable small little processes happening all throughout the brain in really fast frequencies but to integrate that into a total sensory, I'm here in the room experience, you need slower oscillations coupling those faster oscillations together. Now, 
It has been said that if you knew all the anatomical locations of the brain, like with one of those circuit maps, and which and what each oscillation frequency meant, you would have an alphabet of the brain and you could like decode the brain. Now we've already done this in a sense. If you think of brain computer interface where someone's either hooked up to electrodes or they actually implant a chip into the brain, what those systems are doing are taking a look at the brainwave oscillations and translating them into a task. So for instance, if you have someone in a wheelchair, you can put a chip in their head and translate the brainwaves into moving a a cursor on a computer screen or perhaps even controlling a robotic arm that's been done as well. So you're taking that brainwave oscillation information and translating it into controlling things like a mouse cursor or a robotic arm. We're definitely not anywhere close to actually decoding the brain but we can translate some tasks already. So that's what those different oscillation frequencies are for. A more concrete example of the oscillation frequencies would be increasing in complexity of my understanding of what's going on in a room. So if you showed me, say, a picture of a grid, that would be a pretty quick oscillation. My unconscious processes would pick that up pretty immediately. My occipital cortex would fire very fast, saying, okay, that shape is a grid, I recognize that. Okay, uh, one that would take slower oscillation frequency because it's taking different little pieces would be like reading a written page. So I see a word, and my brain quickly recognizes its shapes, but it needs to combine that from the shapes that came before and after it, you know, the other letters in the word, the other words themselves and the page, to bring that to my conscious awareness. So you're taking those fast little oscillations and combining them with slower oscillations to create more of a conscious process, which is understanding what's actually on the written uh, page. Now, even further out from that would be total sensory integration. So me in this room right now, there's these lights, uh, I can hear the streets outside, I'm talking to this camera. So my conscious awareness of what's going on around me requires a lot of different little pieces of information. So the small pieces of information are these quick oscillated frequencies, whereas the total integration, the total understanding and putting all of that together are these slower oscillations that's happening uh, all throughout the brain, connecting the different parts of the brain so I can bring that to conscious awareness. Now at this point we're going to talk about something a lot of people get confused about, but it's the fact that a raw EEG signal contains all the frequencies and all the locations of all the electrical activity in the head. Now that can be very confusing. Basically what I'm saying is, remember how the EEG signal is the difference between two electrodes? It's the voltage difference between them. Well, there's no reason that they're only picking up the electrical activity in that little area. It can be influenced by any electrical activity in theory that's happening within the brain, depending on how good the connection is. So how on earth do we take a raw EEG signal and break it into its individual pieces? How do we break it into uh, the individual frequency bands and how do we break it into the locations that they're coming from? We're going to use two concepts to be able to do that. To break it up into frequencies, we're going to use something called the fast Fourier transformation. To break it into locations, we're going to use something called the inverse problem. Now don't let those two concepts get you worked up. We're going to talk about them and we're going to break them down in detail. So let's talk about breaking it down into different frequency patterns using the fast Fourier transformation. Now the fast Fourier transformation has been called one of the most important mathematical formulas of this century. It was developed so that we can take a complex signal and break it into individual components. If you think about it, that raw EEG signal is representing all the little random electrical activity within the brain. It's a mess. There's no way you'd be able to make anything out of it. But when you plug that data from the raw EEG signal into the fast Fourier transformation, it breaks it down into individual frequencies. It uses mathematical matrices and calculates what waveforms contributed to the overall waveform. So you can have different waveforms at different frequencies combined to make that complex signal and the um, mathematical formula takes it from the complex and breaks it down into the simple. So you can have a raw EEG signal and see what ratio of that signal is happening at 2 hertz and we call that delta and you could also see what ratio of that signal is happening at 10 hertz and call that alpha. And basically you're breaking it down into different frequency bands like that. Now what researchers noticed over time is that if you're running an experiment, depending on what the subject's doing, the different brain ratios will be different. Um, so a period of time in an experiment is called an epoch. And let's say you would have an epoch with the subject 
having their eyes open, and an epoch with the subject having their eyes closed. So those are two discrete time periods in the experiment with two different conditions of the patient or the subject. And what you would see is if you took the raw EEG signal from where they had their eyes open and the raw EEG signal from when they had their eyes closed, the ratios of uh, frequency bands would be different. So a good example is the alpha frequency. And what you would see is from the raw EEG signal, break that down from the fast Fourier transformation into the different frequency bands, you would see alpha around 12 hertz uh, relatively low with the eyes open, but as soon as the subject closed their eyes, you would get a big spike in alpha activity. It's actually one of the most powerful EEG signals uh, known, is when you close your eyes, for some reason, the back of your head starts oscillating in an alpha frequency, and we know that from countless experiments. And that's what happens over time. Uh, scientists just build this catalog of data where they have people do different experimental conditions, take that raw EEG signal and break it down into its frequency components and watch the ratios change. That's how we can tell um, how at different mind states or different motor states or whatever you're doing, there's gonna be different ratios of brain waves. And that's how they've characterized the different brain waves to represent different things. So we've got these arbitrary definitions, and I'm gonna talk about this more in my next video, but we've got um, brain waves called delta, then we've got brain waves called uh, theta, then we've got brain waves called alpha and beta. And these are arbitrary names for ranges of frequencies. And we name them because, number one, it's arbitrary, but number two, we notice that within these range of frequencies, there's things that are typically going on with the person. And as I described, the alpha with the eyes closed is a good example of that. Now what helped my understanding of this was taking a look at a histogram. I think it's one of the best ways to represent a raw EEG signal that's run through a fast Fourier transformation because you can see on the y-axis is the amount that each frequency band contributes to the overall signal. So the higher the bar, the bigger the contribution. On the x-axis, you see the frequency uh, bands. So you might have each bar represent one hertz. So the delta frequency range would have three to four bars because each one is representing one hertz, but delta is a range from one to four. So you can see what the different, um, different delta frequencies do to the overall signal. And so it's not a concrete definition. People will designate between low beta and high beta because beta is a range of, of frequencies and each frequency, every little discrete frequency band has its own uh, characteristic properties where it is in the brain. But uh, we have by, by culture and by history broken it down to these arbitrary uh, definitions and divisions. But again, the histogram is a good way to look at it because you can see the whole range of frequencies and how much they each contribute to the overall EEG signal. And that's how uh, we break down these raw EEG signals into the individual frequencies. Now let's talk about how we locate where exactly these different EEG signals are coming from. First of all, the more electrodes that you have on the head, the better you're gonna be able to pinpoint where exactly these signals are coming from. The more electrodes you have on the head, the better the resolution, the spatial resolution. Now, spatial resolution means you'll be able to pinpoint exactly where the signal is coming from. So the best analogy for this, for the inverse problem, is to think of a, a crowded room. There's a lot of people in the room that are conversing. There's all these different conversations going on. And all around the room are different microphones. The microphones represent the electrodes. Just like the microphones are listening to the people talk in the room, the electrodes are listening to the different electrical frequencies in the brain. So if you think about it, each microphone theoretically can hear all the different conversations in the room. Every one of the microphones can hear all the conversations. But through the inverse problem, you can feed all that information into a computer, per se, and the computer would be able to figure out, okay, this microphone's on this side of the room, and this couple's conversation is louder than that couple's conversation in this microphone. So you can kind of tell how far each conversation is from the microphone. And since you have all the data from all the microphones, you can reconstruct what the room actually looks like because each microphone will have a different profile. Each microphone will have one couple that's closer to it than another couple or group of people. So the same thing works with the electrodes on your scalp. Basically the computer can tell, hey, these EEG signals I can see in both of these electrodes, but 
they're louder in this electrode than that electrode, which means that signal must be happening closer to that electrode. And when you combine all that data, and don't <laughs> kid yourself, it's a lot of data, the computer can use, especially if it has a whole bunch of electrodes, the computer can use that data to pinpoint where exactly the electrical activity is happening in the brain. And I've seen estimates that EEG now is able to get consistently down to seven millimeters of uh, accuracy. So not quite nearly as accurate as say a functional MRI, but much cheaper and much easier to do and pretty good spatial resolution and much better temporal resolution because temporal resolution is how it's occurring in time. And the EEG signal, you can pick up the electricity just right after the event, whereas an fMRI machine is just picking up the oxygen levels that change after the event. So EEG signal, not as good as spatial resolution, but excellent temporal resolution in the signal. One of the cool things about having the computer break down the locations of the EEG signal through the inverse problem is you can create programs like Loretta that maps the EEG signal over an MRI brain scan of the patient. So you could take an MRI scan before or after the EEG signal, and after the computer knows where the signals are coming from, it can overlay that map onto the MRI brain, and you've got this cool picture where you can see the whole brain and where the EEG signals are coming from in the subject. Anyways, going further, we've talked about the fast Fourier transformation, how you break it down in individual frequencies, and also the inverse problem where you break it down into individual locations. And that's how we take our raw EEG signal, break it down into its individual components, correlate it with what's going on with the experiment, and figure out how the brain waves are correlating to mental and physical behavior. Then we can use that to translate it into things like brain computer interface where people can communicate with pointers on a computer screen or robotic arms or anything that can happen in the future. It is crazy where this technology is going. And also it's pretty awesome that these chips within the, the devices are so small that they can, um, and powerful enough to create these powerful calculations. If you think about it, in one of these devices, the electrical activity is going in through the electrodes getting analyzed in this area with the amplifier, being changed into a digital signal that's being sent to your smartphone to give you feedback on meditation or any other mental processes that you're doing. The technology is coming along quickly and I think it's gonna revolutionize our world. Okay, so we've talked about how the actual devices work in my previous video. We talked about the actual brain waves and how we break them down in, my, in this video. In the next video, we're gonna talk about the individual brain wave frequencies and what we know about them. This is Cody Raw with Tech for Psych. Thanks so much for listening in. We're gonna do more product breakdowns. We're gonna do more interviews with people that are doing great things in mental health and wellness. And we're also gonna be looking at more self-development topics that were directly influenced by the neuroscience that we're learning here. Please support the channel by subscribing. And if you have any additional questions, I can be reached at hello at techforpsych.com. Thank you so much for the listen. Talk to you again sometime soon.